Welcome to a very special celebration episode of the EBPF and Cilium Office Hours, because this, as you probably have read somewhere, this is the 100th episode of Echo. So I'm delighted that you're here with us. Uh, if you are watching live, don't forget to say hello. We always love to hear who's watching. We love your questions. We'd love to hear where you're watching us from. So uh, yeah, say hello in the chat. I know there's always a little bit of a delay between uh, us speaking and YouTube broadcasting. So uh, yeah, we're looking forward to getting your questions. All right. So aside from this being the 100th episode, amazing, a couple of people are saying hello. So hi to Tony. And hi to Nuno the Corsair, who I happen to know won some uh, Cilium swag just recently and was on the socials uh, sharing pictures of that. So great to see you on Echo as well. Fantastic. All right. Yes. So the other big news this week is that Cilium 1.14 is now released. If you're a regular viewer of the show, you probably saw episode 95, which was, I guess, five weeks ago, uh, where Nico showed me a lot of the main features that uh, are in this release. If you want to read about all of these amazing things that have gone in, then do check out the, uh, the blog post. Uh, there's a link to it in the show notes. So if you follow that link down there, you'll find HackMD and you'll find the show notes for this episode also what's showing here on the screen and uh yeah do read that blog post it's quite a long read because there's loads of great things that have gone into the release a few more people who are saying hello great to have you with us Oshi Gupta and now I never quite know how to pronounce those O's with the slash through it so I'm going to just go with Oivind and hope that that's not too far off the mark but wonderful to have you all watching Right, so we saved the best feature till last to talk about from the 1.14 release, and it is the new way of doing mutual authentication. So to discuss that, I want to bring some very special guests into the show. We have Thomas Graff, who I'm sure many of you will be familiar with, who is the CTO at Isovalent, and we also have Mucha Eskins, who basically built this feature that we're about to see. So wonderful to have you both on the show. Thanks for having us. Great honor to be here in the 100th episode. Congratulations, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So this is all about mutually authenticating workloads in Cilium Mesh. And I guess it might be useful to just talk a little bit about Cilium Mesh before we get into the mutual authentication part. So maybe Thomas, you can talk us a little bit through like what differentiates Cilium Service Mesh from the other Service Mesh implementations out there. Absolutely, yes. So I think we started out not building a Service Mesh at all, right? Everybody knows us as DCNI, Cilium being DCNI. And in the, on that journey, we got asked by a lot of users could you help us build a service mesh that avoids this sidecar injection or the sidecar cost that you can see on this on the screen, right? The typical service mesh implementations in the past have been using so-called sidecar proxies, running a individual proxy inside of every application pod, requiring this very complex injection from a networking perspective. And of course, also running a a large footprint or a large number of them, each of them adding to the total footprint of memory um, and CPU, which eventually resulted in the in the in the in coining the term service mess. And Cilium <laughs> Service Mesh was the was the first service mesh out there that brought a sidecar free approach to the table, which means we can build or we can provide service mesh functionality, but we do not depend on running a proxy inside 
of the of the application part at all. Instead, we consider the service mesh functionality part of the connectivity stack, right? If you are thinking about something like TCP IP or other networking functionality, then it's just part of what the kernel offers you and your application consumes and uses it. And you don't even have to think about it. It's just there and the operating system offers it to you. And we think about service mesh in exactly the same way. It should be part of your kernel stack, essentially. So this is kind of the simplified picture, but this is actually what really happens for a good portion of the Cilium Service Mesh functionality. You never actually leave the kernel. That does not mean that Cilium Service Mesh is all only eBPF. We actually do use Envoy, even though for today's topic, we actually won't go into that too much because mutual authentication we can do entirely with an authentication agent. We don't even need a full-blown proxy. But if we do, for example, for layer seven load balancing, then we use, or we still use Envoy, but we actually bring it into the picture or into the stack in a much more effective and efficient way, and not requiring to even make the proxy part of the application part. So that's essentially the bottom line of Cilium Service Mesh. It's a full-blown service mesh, sidecar-free and even proxy-free for a lot of the use cases. And I know from talking to community members that they're really excited about, you know, not having to manage sidecars in pods. The operational overhead can be pretty significant, not to mention, you know, potential impact on, on latency and performance. So we've seen lots of people excited about sidecar free service mesh, but they do often have this question, but how do I get MTLS between my applications? So Thomas, do you want to talk us through? Yeah, so I think it, this was this was the last big feature that was missing for Cilium Service Mesh. We had all the other Service Mesh features uh, for a while now, and mutual authentication was like, yes, we want to provide this. It's actually a major motivation for a lot of Service Mesh or for all of users to look at Service Mesh is to do mutual authentication and to encrypt. And we wanted to make sure that we think about this and don't just repeat what others have been doing, but actually like look at this and consider options. If we start very simple, that's kind of what we want, right? We want to have a CA, which is uh, handling um, certificates. We have a sender, we have a receiver, or we could point two services at this. And then we want to perform mutual authentication between sender and receiver, right? Sender authenticates receiver, receiver authenticates sender. In the past, from a high level view, these were the two options that were available. The left side is the sidecar-based mutual authentication, where a sidecar or a proxy is performing an MTLS handshake and is requiring for the data between the services to then go through that MTLS connection. In that way, it kind of stays above the network. The network doesn't even really see that an authentication is happening. The network is just there to essentially route the traffic. That's a typical MTLS model with a uh, sidecar-based approach. On the right side, we see the, the classic traditional network level authentication, for example, using IPsec or WireGuard, where the network, is, um, the network is authenticated. So every node gets a key and nodes authenticate each other and all the traffic between nodes is encrypted. This is what you get when you run Cilium in IPsec or WireGuard encryption before today. The, both models have pros and cons. And what we thought about is we really wanted to avoid the cons of the, the proxy of the sidecar based model, but we also wanted to avoid some of the cons that the network level encryption has. Because one of the biggest downsides of network level encryption is that when the keys get compromised, you essentially compromise that entire node, or if it is a pre-share key for the entire network, the entire network. Right? But the proxy model also has significant downsides. First of all, you need to run proxies. This adds latency. Um, you only support typically TCP, so you, you're really limited in protocol support. You need to manage the life cycle of these proxies and so on. So what we've built, and this is actually, we have not invented this. Um, this is not a completely new concept. This is actually very similar to what Google is using internally. Google is calling this ALTS application, Layer Transport Security. And it's essentially a combination of the two modes. Like if on the left two boxes, you have the session-based TLS or MTLS, 
uh, with proxies and then on the, the, the network level uh, encryption. And on the side, you see when we combine them, but we, we essentially keep the handshake and the encryption, the data part is separated. And we'll see a demo, we'll have a, a life of a packet later on where we can see how this actually works. But this means we have a step one where we do the handshake with TLS, a mutual TLS handshake to do the actual authentication. But then the actual data transfer remains untouched inside of the kernel and we can use IPsec and WireGuard to encrypt it. And this gives us kind of the good of both worlds, which is really exciting. Like it has a lot of additional security benefits, but even more importantly, I think, it really allows us to effortlessly ro roll out mutual authentication across an entire cluster. Fantastic. Right. So before we move on to the demo, I just want to say hello to a few other people who've uh, joined us. So hi to Michi. Hi to Daniel. Uh, hi to Joseph. And then uh, there is some love here for Machi's necklace here. So <laughs> fantastic. I sign all my commits with this. Brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So I think now would be a really great time to see th this next gen mutual authentication in action. So, Marcia, over to you. Thank you, Liz. Okay, let's try this out. Thomas said some amazing words about how this works, but we all want to see it actually working, I hope. So, what you're looking at is my screen. And not only my screen, but you're looking at my Kubernetes cluster. This is a small Kubernetes cluster, not too much important workload, which I actually run inside my closet at home. So I hope it stays working. And let's take a look at what's uh, running here. So this is my demo namespace, but I actually want to look at all namespaces. So what do we have in my little demo cluster? We have Cilium Spire. I installed Spire the Spire server, which will handle all our certificates and will sign everything for us, maintain the CA without me doing any of the OpenSSL commands automatically. This was just one Helm flag and I had it installed. Oops, that went down. I have this little demo namespace, which is my whole demo is based inside this namespace. I have a client here, which is just the basic Ubuntu shell. I'll use it to execute some fun commands. I have an internal Nginx server, just simple Nginx, no extra security layers, just Nginx with some web pages. I have a legacy application because everybody runs legacy, right? So I also run legacy at home. In the cube system, I have my normal Cilium installation, the Cilium operator, everything running normally. I also have Hubble running because of course, I'll show you some nice Hubble flows where this all is working. And I also run OpenEBS to arrange my storage because this is a VM cluster. No fancy cloud providers are involved, uh, but I need storage somehow, but that's not important for this demo. Okay, I'm completely running inside this demo namespace. However, I did not deploy any Scylla network policies yet. Okay, let's tr put some security inside this little cluster. I have your policy file, which I wrote before the show because coding this live will be very stressful. Um, which is two network policies inside here. The first one is to allow traffic to my Nginx server. I want my HTTP to be accessible within my cluster. Okay, I just match the Nginx server and I allow all ingress traffic, which as you would want with a web server, to port 80 TCP normal HTTP traffic. I want this from everything inside the cluster. I currently don't care about other namespaces, systems. I want every traffic that comes from within the cluster to be able to access this. And this here is new, authentication mode required. This got added in Cilium 114, which I just upgraded to yesterday, as it was released yesterday. Authentication mode required. This simply says, oh, all traffic to this Nginx server must have been required. No other traffic, no optional requirements. All, require, all traffic must have authentication done before, otherwise it will be denied. You can also disable this, and there is a little test flag, which is only to deny everything for testing things, but you should never use that. Just mode required. This two lines of YAML, and we have our whole mutual authentication done. My selling policy is for my client. I want to be able, my client can access anything in the world because I want my Ubuntu shell to be able to fetch some updates, sign on some packets, have some fun. Um, just anything, anything inside the cluster is allowed to access it. Not much security over there, probably, just small test deployment. 
Oh, uh, but I also require it to access DNS. I say, oh, you can access my cube uh, system DNS server, which is called DNS. And you can query anything on port 53 UDP and authentication mode required. Wait a minute. Uh, what is What can Cilium do? What a proxy-based approach cannot do is proxies will send it over a TLS connection. A TLS connection is built on top of TCP. I am running UDP here because this all happens out of band. And this all happens transparently encrypted on my cluster. I can send anything, not just TCP, but also UDP traffic. I forgot to tell you, you can see my cluster running, but what you cannot see is that I run WireGuard. All my network encryption is completely encrypted, pot to pot, node to node. And OK, um, anything to world is allowed because I want to run some apt commands later. OK, let's deploy this. Live deployment. Oh, let me also deploy the same thing for my legacy application because I don't want my legacy application to be exposed to the internet. It's legacy after all. And I created my network policy. Fun. OK, this works. Bye. Uh, no. Let's try this out. Uh, let's look. I have here a client. Perfect. Let's shell into that. Okay, this is a normal Ubuntu shell. I'm even root. Amazing. Uh, what can I do in here? Everything. Um, let's see what services I'm running. Let me do kubectl get service. And I have two services. I have an echo for this live stream, which is a cluster IP port 80. That's my Nginx server. I also have the legacy application exposed on a node port just to have that for the next step in my demo. OK, back to my shell. So I can just do curl echo. It will reach out to the Nginx server, and let's see what's on there. Let's wait a moment for my network to work. And there we go. Welcome to the echo live stream internet. Do not share this with anyone, especially on a live stream. And I do it again, and it works. Perfect. I just demoed Kubernetes networking working. Pretty boring, right? Well, no problem. I have Hubble open. So you see here that, indeed, my client is now talking to my internal Nginx servers, and there is a cute little padlock appearing, because this has been secured by mutual authentication. It says this here, mutual alt enabled. OK. Fun, bad luck. Let's look at the actual logs and let's see what's going on. So I had here my client. Oh, perfect. That was before the stream. And this was the first time I ran curl. Wait a second. It says verdict dropped. And when I click on it, I get a reason for it. Drop reason is authentication required. This was the Cilium network policy engine telling me, hey, you are not allowed to access it yet. Why? Because there's no authentication done. This is what we do to signal from the data path to the CLM agent that we need authentication done. And OK, this is the actual packet being dropped. It shows twice in the UI. In the, in the CLI, you see that it are two different types. And the next packet that arrives, because TCP retries, is perfectly forwarded. It works. OK, and for the rest, every time I refresh, here is the next one. I type a curl again, and it perfectly forwarded. What happens here with authentication required? So the data part told the Cilium agent, hey, I need authentication done here. What did the Cilium agent do? Well, it took the key materials from Spire for both identities, and it did an MTLS handshake between the two nodes. And just to demo this, I have it open. I already was SSH'd into one of my Kubernetes nodes, and I did an actual good old-fashioned TCP dump. And here is this. For 4250, which is what I configured for my MTLS handshakes to happen on. And it talked between two nodes, which in this case is the same node. And it completed a full TLS 1.3 MTLS handshake using both keys, verifying that this is allowed. It looked at the CM network identities and then looked at the Spire identities. It could be key materials and it did a complete handshake authentication in both. That was the only part I was missing in WireGuard, was identity to identity verification. Um, how can I see what has happened here? Um, well, there is this little command where you can read BPF maps in Cilium. So if you just exec in one of your Cilium agents and you do Cilium BPF art list, okay, you just get the content of the authentication map, which is what the Cilium policy engine will use to get, okay, is this flow to be allowed? And there it is here. I have my source identity, which is the internal numeric identity for my two workloads here. 
I have uh, one on the remote node, which is my other. It's a two node cluster, by the way. And zero means local node. It has been done using the Spire authentication mechanism, meaning MTLS with Spire. Um, this is just there. In the future, we might add more uh, key sources. Uh, currently, we only have Spire. And an expiration date. This expiration date is actually the lowest expiration date in, this, in the certificates that have been used in the handshake. This will then be used, OK, if it's uh, after 19 hours 16 UTC time, this will disappear. But it probably won't. Why? Well, we can't have traffic to stay flowing. So now we have this in the map. Every time that Spire gets a certificate rotation or a CA rotation, it needs to renew the key material, which is by default every 30 minutes, it will signal Cilium. And Cilium will then look at this map. Is this key currently in use? And if it is, it will de do the handshake. So your traffic will just keep on flowing. And every 30 minutes, your MTLS handshake will be renewed and we'll check that everybody has the right cryptographic material from our Spire server. But your traffic won't notice, your application won't notice. It will just happily keep flowing like nothing is going on and no problem at that. Also, should I make a multi-threaded application, it will reuse this entry, meaning that multiple threads will not have to do an MTLS handshake again, whereas a proxy-based approach, or even before that, a library-based approach, would have to do a whole TLS handshake, which takes a while every time it has to reconnect. Cilium tries to make this more efficient. Great, right? OK, oops, that's for later. That was a surprise. Good, we saw some traffic flowing. OK, networking works, and it's more secure. But wait a minute. What was this one thing I never explained before? Asset. I did not deploy this. What is going on? Yeah, my two-node cluster is now a three-node cluster. And it's also, it's also a different Kubernetes version, because why not? Asset burn is in my cluster. Looks like my mainframe got compromised. OK, I added a hack node into it. And my hack node somehow got access to my QPPI server, got all materials to identificate, got even Cilium set up. And OK, somehow this is in my cluster. Well, I actually faked this because if I could just hack Kubernetes that way, I would have reported it and not actually showed it in the live stream. Um, but it got everything except one part, which is Spire attestation. Spire has this great mechanism which it can attestate a node. So it says, oh, this node is actually part of this Kubernetes cluster. It's not just a rogue thing trying to commit over the network. If you're running in a cloud provider, you can go even one step further and attestate, hey, is this node actually in the same Amazon account in the same Google account. That is what Spire can do and give you some additional layer of security. And that's what's missing here. OK, uh, let's see what this acid burn person deployed on my cluster. Um, mm -hmm. One pot in the demo namespace. I don't know. Uh, let's look into that. Oh, uh, seems to be just a Ubuntu shell. Because why not? That's the first thing I would also deploy when I compromise a cluster. Uh, even root access, amazing. Um, let me try to uh, curl echo. As it were, all our secrets, all our scripts for the next 100 episodes are in this internet. <laughs> OK, let's wait. Uh, nothing is happening. That's a good sign. I hope this uh, now returns an error. Let's take a moment to appreciate the error. And there it is, could not resolve host. Oh, DNS doesn't work. Why? It's always DNS. <laughs> it's always DNS. <laughs> but I also said to my DNS server, hey, you should only accept mutually authenticated connections, which is the first to do DNS over mutual authentication connections. OK, let's work around DNS, because it's always DNS. I know how to fix this. Uh, just, just copy the cluster IP, right? You have cluster access anyway. Let's go the IP address. Ah, doesn't work. Well, that's what we want, right? Let's take a look at what's going on inside. Oh, let's first look at my TCP dump here. There is something going on here. It actually is trying to attempt the MTLS handshake. It tries to get into break into Cilium. And what we see here is the two nodes trying to agree on a handshake. However, Acid Burn got none of our CA material, got none of our certificates, got nothing to authenticate a connection with, which my actual Kubernetes cluster will say, <laughs> no, and will deny the connection. We can also see this happening inside of Hubble. 
we'll just keep saying, hey, uh, my ingress policy and ingress nginx, uh, sorry, on internal nginx, ingress nginx is something else, is, OK, hi, I would love to talk to you assets, uh, but I need some kind of authentication done. Please come back when you got that. And it keeps failing. Oh, it keeps trying to go back to the same idea, like, yeah, can you do MTLS with this person? And it will keep attempting. It says, no, they don't have any key materials. And the traffic will just keep dropping. So if we look just... further back in history, will we see that DNS request getting dropped as well? I think I can in Cube system. I did not prepare this, so let's see if this works. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of going on in Cube system. It's a little bit too much traffic without Hubble also being Hubble itself. Uh, yeah, monitoring. it might be too much. Yeah. Yeah, maybe if I filter on dropped. Sorry, this was an unplanned yeah. extra bit of demo that I just. Uh... <laughs> I would love to show it, uh, but I think it's out of my local cache. Um, you can only keep storing flows inside your browser for that long. Yeah, we just see, keep seeing the drops here. Yeah. OK, so perfect. We got a tiny little of additional security in our cluster, even though somebody was able to compromise my whole cluster, somehow still not able to reach my secret intranet. Let's exit this. OK, we saw something work. We saw something fail. Now let's go for something fun. I love legacy applications. Don't get me wrong, I'm a big nerd. I just love playing with old technology. You cannot see it, but there is an old Windows 95 computer right here. I even ship my Cilium on floppy disk somehow. Uh, <laughs> I love old things. Uh, so when I was preparing this demo, I thought to have a little bit of fun. But let's look first at the network policy. It's an old application. We want to have that secured in some way. <laughs> it probably is full of vulnerabilities. It doesn't have any good cryptographic libraries. Uh, I don't trust this thing at all. And that's what I wrote in my policy. I said, you can access uh, DNS. Sure, we need this, it's essential. That you get, but only if you mutually authenticated before. Uh, and you can also access our intranet on port 80 only, and only if you mutually authenticated. Okay, what is the oldest application? I know how to deploy in Kubernetes. It is Windows 94. So we're going back to Windows 95 because the 90s are very hot right now. And I have Windows 94 terminal server deployed, which was the first Windows version featuring a remote desktop. That's why I could log in from it from my Linux computer. And OK, it's Windows 94. It's probably something you don't want to trust on your network. But thanks to Cilium, we can make it a little bit more trustworthy. Let's open Internet Explorer here and see if we can reach the internet. It's trying to call out to Microsoft. And whew, it failed. I don't want this old Windows, uh, Windows NT4 to reach out to Microsoft and fetch something new like updates. Perfect. Why did I also choose this? It has a little bit of fun. Like, yeah, you could ship your application with cryptographic libraries. Sure. Um, but this is from the 90s. In the 90s, it was illegal to export any good encryption outside of the US. Well, I actually took my European version of Windows NT4, because I live in Europe. And I only get 40-bit RSA encryption, because anything above that was illegal in the 90s to have outside of the US. Yet, I somehow made it completely secure thanks to our WireGuard, so I don't have to worry about this old encryption thing anymore. Again, this runs inside my Kubernetes cluster. It's just a normal pod. It doesn't have root privileges. It just runs as a normal application. And I can access anything inside my cluster like I would from my pod. Let's take a look at history, because I don't want to type this all live. Well, you all know how DNS works in Kubernetes. I hope if you're on this live stream, you do. And you know that I can just go to the service name, dot the namespace, dot SCC, dot cluster, dot local. Because this runs in Kubernetes, it just talks to core DNS, I can just use the same scheme. OK. Go to echo, dot demo, dot SVC, dot cluster, dot local. You see it from the IP address. And you see, welcome to the echo live stream intranet. Perfect. This worked. And this also was mutually identified. Don't trust me for it, trust the Hubble. And I see here, legacy app appeared nice on my flow. And I see it's still a little padlock here. And what I see here is that, yep, this again is this first drop that happened on the first time I connected and notification required. 
Windows SD NT4 was very used to drop traffic, so it immediately retried again. And there we are. The handshake was done between the two CDM agents. All cryptographic material was present. This was not on any compromised notes. And we have here fully secured, authenticated, encrypted, integrated traffic from Windows NT4 to my Nginx server. To prove this is real, I can go to a second URL and just do slash secret, which has a very biggest company secret in there. And it says, kudos to all Cilium contributors. You all are amazing. And this is really true. Brilliant. Uh, I want to end in a small disclaimer that is that Windows NT4 is really old and you should not deploy this in your production servers at all. Just because I do stupid things on a live stream doesn't mean that you should do them at work. And that's basically everything I have to show today. Wonderful. Thank you for that. So uh, while you were showing that, there was lots of love for your home lab on-prem cluster. And that came in before we even saw Windows NT. So uh, <laughs> fantastic. Also, Nuno telling a little story of appreciation here about showing how to run a VM on Kubernetes years ago. And it blew his mind. So you've got track record here. And we really appreciate it. Thank you so much for that demo. I think that was wonderful. So now that we've seen it in action, let's, um, let's just dig into the technology a little bit more. I guess, first of all, in the blog post, we've described it as effortless mutual authentication. So Thomas, do you want to just dive in a little bit to what we mean when we say effortless? Yeah, so I think uh, I mean, the demo was was amazing, right? I think when we started this feature, nobody nobody would have assumed that we would use Windows to to, <laughs> to demo the the mutual thing. And to me, it's mind blowing that we're able to enhance the encryption capabilities of such an old piece of software. So I think effortless. I think you saw it in March's demo really well. I think there's a whole Spire Spiffy stack running in the background, managing certificates. Uh, you can just deploy your Kubernetes deployments as usual. And Spiffy Spire just manages everything for you. That's all done by Cilium. Sing single Helm flag is needed to just bring the Spiffy Spire stack along. And it automatically generates uh, the certificates. Cilium already very conveniently has an identity concept. And it can simply tie the Spiffy certificates to the identities. And then when you go about to actually roll this out, you saw Marcia really nicely actually demonstrate how you can add just two, two lines of YAML in existing Cilium network policies, and you can start just enforcing mutual authentication between individual services. You don't need to go big and actually migrate your entire cluster. You don't need to install new CRDs. Two lines of YAML between two services in your Cilium network policy is enough, and you can just start slow right, and go namespace by namespace or service by service. That's what, what we mean by effortless, right? There's no additional fleets of proxies running. Um, it looks very seamless. It's the same experience as you have with network policy, all the way from simplicity to get it up and running, as well as Hubble, like actually giving you observability if something goes wrong. So now like digging into log files of proxies and all of that. That's what we mean by effortless. We wanted to have the same simple experience as with network policies. And um, Marcia, in the demo, you were talking about having, uh, you know, traffic encrypted. What did you have to do to enable that transparent encryption? Cilium install dash dash encryption is equal to WireGuard. I did not have to do any key exchanges. Just do this. I'll do it on all my home clusters. This is not my only home cluster. Um, this was, yeah, we really reached for effortless and even... I didn't work on the WireGuard part, but that was also just effortless, just simple installation and done. Great. And I think it's really um, important for people to sort of understand that those two things can be enabled separately. So you have the option of encryption without authentication if you don't need it. And we've had that for a long, long time. And we also have the option to do authentication without encryption if we needed that. And I know we have some, some users in sort of, you know, financial where like, the CPU cycles required for encryption even could be, uh, you know, extra overhead that they really uh, don't want to incur. So I think this adds tons of extra, you know, flexibility. Um, maybe, Thomas, you can just talk a little bit more about how this compares to proxy-based TLS. I know we saw some of this in the demo, but let's just sort of uh, make sure that some of those points came out. Yeah. 
So I think the biggest overall point I would say is that we don't need proxies. And that sounds like, well, what's the deal with proxies? But if you need proxies to essentially be like middle, middle hops for all of your connections, then you are turning every single service to service connection into a connection from the app to the proxy, from the proxy to the proxy, and from the proxy to the app. And that just adds not only latency, but also a ton of overhead. And it also adds massive complexity in how to deal with key rotation, uh, rolling out new certificates and all of this. And all of this just disappears with the model we have of Cilium, right? You've seen Marcia describe that, well, we can actually roll out new certificates every 30 minutes. Your existing connections in the clusters, they continue flowing as long as the authentication, the re-authentication continues to succeed, right? If for whatever reason you have an ongoing connection and the certificate is no longer valid, that connection will get shut down even though it was before actually authenticated. Um, successfully. So we don't have this vulnerability where a long-lived connection, once authenticated, can then live forever. So there's just a massive benefit from just not requiring proxies at all to do mutual authentication. And very nice, the demo also showed UDP, right? It's a one, it's a the most well-known example of non-TCP traffic. But if we go into, let's say, the more enterprise world, then TCP is not at all the only protocol that is being used, right? Um, with this model, we can even support multicast in the future. And if you've been thinking MTLS or mutual authentication and multicast, those things probably never have sounded like something that is compatible. With this model, it's absolutely possible, right? Then I think supporting the existing identity and certificate management, right? So Cilium already has an identity concept that is built into Kubernetes. We've now nicely tied this into an authentication agent with a plugin system and brought an initial implementation with Spiffy or Inspire. But this is not at all limited to this. Um, it's of course compatible with anything that generates or hand manages X509 certificates. So if you want to bring Cert Manager, Vault, or something else in the future, totally fine. Or even some other completely different systems that don't use MTLS for the mutual authentication, some other mutual authentication system that you might actually um, have, all, you could bring that and plug that in, in into the Cilium stack as well. So that's also very important to us. We're not actually tied into just one way of doing mutual authentication. We really wanted to build a framework that is pluggable. This handshake caching and reauthentication goes both ways. So I think that's actually adds massive flexibility that adds security, but also I think avoids a lot of latency down the line. With a proxy-based model, you essentially are required to create a new MTLS connection every time you need service-to-service -service, um, connectivity, right? In particular, in the sidecar model, you need to open a connection inside of every service. There is no actual sharing or anything like this. With Cilium, we have flexibility, right? Whether we want to cache authentication uh, or um, so successful authentication requests, or whether we want to require re-authentication in a specific interval. So you can configure, for example, Cilium to require re-authentication every 50 minutes. And if you have connections going on, Cilium will do a new handshake every 15 minutes to validate uh, whether, it is, whether that's actually allowed or still allowed or not. I think those benefits are um, massive, right? And I think, of course, fewer proxies, much, much reduced footprint, memory, CPU, and so on. Um, I think from, from that perspective, this model is clearly superior. And again, we we're, were not the first ones to invent this. If you want to have like a deeper dive into, uh, into kind of how the concept concept um, um, kind of got created. Uh, Google is running this inside Borg called, called ALTS. If you Google ALTS, you will find a great article with all the details on why not MTLS, not TLS for Borg and why, a, why, 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 ATL, why ALTS, it's just such, a, such a hard word. Um, and you can find a lot of background there as well. I'll dig that out and add the link into the show notes uh, a little bit after the show. Uh, unless anyone out there wants to find it and uh, add it in themselves, because you can find it on HackMD. Links down there. Uh, 
Also, if you're watching and you have any questions, uh, do type them in and we will try and cover those. Um, I would like us to just dive a little bit into um, that kind of spiffy identity. And I think, Thomas, you have a, a diagram of um, kind of what's happening. And maybe we can also talk about how what the spiffy identity represents in, in what we've done here. Yeah, absolutely. I'll just uh, share my screen again. Now, if I shared Marcia's screen again, I can see that playing. Was it patience? <laughs> <laughs> I have to do something during the stream. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, but instead we will we'll look at the the spire. The spire uh, spiffy. This, this contains all the components involved. It's kind of representing the life of a packet when it gets authenticated and includes all the pieces from the eBPF data path to the Cilium agent, the spire agent, the spire server, as well as the Cilium agent or Cilium pod of another node, right? So we start at the lower left. You have a pod, and that pod is sending a packet or a present in this case, right? <laughs> And that results in a network packet. That's the red box in the EBPF data path. The EBPF data path will then look at its own policy and will essentially see, hey, I need authentication. So before even being allowed to send this out, like, hey, I need authentication. Am I authenticated already? And it will look at this authentication table. This is what, what, uh, what we've seen in a demo before. And if the authentication is not done yet, it will drop the packet and send a drop authentication required uh, drop notification up to the Cilium agent. Right now, we're actually really dropping this packet. In the future, we might actually delay the network packet. In this first implementation, it's simply dropping, and that's actually not a problem at all. Authentication is very quick, but it down the line will probably just delay the packet and hold it up until the authentication has happened. Now we're entering user space, and you can see that at this point, we're completely disconnected from the data path. So any sort of certificate handling or authentication handling, all of that is completely away from the actual data path. So there is no attack vector where you can access certificates or something like this. This is a massive benefit that the actual logic, which is dealing with the live network traffic, is very simple and very basic. So in the agent, we now have an authentication request. And this is where the pluggable uh, authentication interface is. And depending on how you have configured Cilium, in this case, it is Spiffy Spire, it will retrieve the identity from uh, the pod, the source pod, and the destination pod. So the, where we are going to the destination service. And from that, the certificate. You can see this kind of in the upper part where we're using the SSVID cache. And essentially, we retrieve um, the, the certificate from the Spire server. While well, the Spire agent has already did already get this from the Spire server, it, it, it has it has it, it has been attestated with the node credentials as well. And we're giving this to the TLS session manager. That's the that's um, box number three. And in this TLS session manager, we're now performing a mutual TLS handshake with the Cilium agent on the remote node where the destination service is running. Right. So think about this agent to agent authentication, not actually the service itself or not in the eBPF. This is agent to agent in user space. When that succeeds, so when that authentication is successful, we're giving a green light down into the data path. That's arrow number four or box number four. So the arrow back down again, and we're adding an entry to the authentication table and saying, hey, this has been authenticated. You can go along. It's only now when we actually allow sending out the traffic. And it's tempting to assume we're all good, but that's actually only half of it. Exactly the same process will happen on the receiving node. So when the packet actually enters the receiving node and before it gets delivered into the destination node, that destination node will not trust the traffic at all. It will look at its policy and if it requires authentication, it will ensure that the authentication has happened. And if it has not happened yet, it will trigger the mutual authentication as well. So that's kind of the, um, the life of a packet here. That's why you've seen in the demo that initial drop and then the forward the flows or forward pack packets going forward. That seems pretty interesting to me. I, I have some idea that mutual 
uh, authentication in MTLS, you have to initiate it from the client. I might be mistaken, but yeah, it's kind of interesting that you can initiate it from the far end, if you like. Yeah, yeah. so I think, I mean, in general, I think um, we, this is all flexible, but we could, of course, cache the successful authentication uh, already on the destination node as well. And it would essentially just, it would still go to user space and we'll hit that cache. But we can also say we actually want to do a full authentication handshake again, right? which adds security, but of course, also latency. So I think this is the, the benefit of this system is that we can really tailor the authentication logic based on the security posture that you want. Fantastic. All right. Anything else that we want to um, dive into about how this works? I think we pretty much covered it, but uh, let me know if there's anything I've missed. I'm not sure. Um, Marcia, what do you think? Did we, did we cover the essence? I think we did. Uh, just yeah. trying to think of something we forgot. I can talk about it for hours, but this is not I guess, I, I mean, the, the other question is, you know, is there anything we can do going forward? What's the kind of next step? Yeah, I think the, the very obvious next step is, uh, I would say, two aspects. Aspect number one is um, the next version or in the next two versions of Cilium, uh, we will actually start handing over the, uh, the... So every time an MTLS handshake is happening, uh, an actual secret is derived from that handshake. And this secret, that's just a binary blob, this secret is what's used for the actual encryption. And typically that's what then the SSL library that you're using is using for the encryption. Well, at that point, it's actually only symmetric encryption. Right? There's nothing, at that point, there's not, nothing that is too different from how, let's say, WireGuard or IPsec encrypt as well. It's just a well-established known way of doing encrypt depending on the cipher that is being used. So the next step is to derive the, the secret from the MTLS handshake that is being done using the service uh, specific certificates and feed that into the encryption layer, which means that we gain not only encryption at the kernel level, but we gain encryption at the kernel level with the service, with the service specific keys or based on the service specific keys. Um, and that is kind of the final step to really getting the best of both worlds. Right now we're like at 90%, right? We're getting kernel level encryption for any protocol. We're getting user space mutual authentication, but we're not using the service specific secret for the encryption. And handing that down will kind of resolve the last 10%. And I think the other very obvious part is we want to hear from all of you. Like try this out, tell us how this is working. Is this as effortless as we want it to be? If not, why not? Like, what, what sort of issues are you hitting? Um, do you have the observability you need? Uh, if not, what, what is needed? What sort of dashboard would you like to have? And so on. So that's a clear, obvious next step. And then the third one, I would say, we are adding cluster mesh support this, to, to this as well. So that we will be able to uh, run MTLS across clusters as well. So even outside of the boundary of a single Kubernetes cluster. And that answers just, Jason's question that I was just about <laughs> to bring up on screen. Just, just, does it work? Just also? adding on this one, uh, we are actually almost there. We just uh, like one thing, which is trust verification between clusters. Right now, you could work, make it work, but the problem is one cluster is not yet sure how to trust another cluster. Uh, Spiffy has a mechanism of this. We're just trying to make this more user-friendly, that you don't have to set up your own uh, things. Uh, it should maybe work if you try your own one. I haven't tried it personally. Don't trust me on this. Uh, but we are very close, and we aim for the next version of Cilium to have this problem solved. We're just trying to make it very user-friendly, and we just have one big issue to solve in this one. That's Maybe fantastic. we can actually proactively talk about a question that I know will come up uh, pretty soon. Um, the question of like integration between Cilium and C-Tunnel, which is, is your ambient meshes um, MTLS implementation? Um, this concept is act, is compatible, can be integrated with C-Tunnel as well. So think about uh, from a perspective that C-Tunnel is not only doing the mutual authentication, but it also just essentially providing a 
a, a secure pipe or a VPN or a tunnel, right? That's why it's called, I guess that's why it's called C tunnel. And uh, this is this is an example where our, our plugin architecture could actually totally fit in. And we, we have been having conversation with uh, the Ambient Match team as well to integrate C tunnel and um, Cilium, which means that instead of IPsec or WireGuard, you could also be using C tunnel for the actual data portion. This is actually different than um, how C-Tunnel is used in Instio Ambient Mesh right now. And I think with that, in combination with what Cilium is doing, it would actually lead to a better architecture um, and both would actually benefit. So that's just something in case uh, that question comes up. Um, that has been a topic and we'll definitely look into that as well over the next 12 months or so. Amazing. So I think we're pretty much you know, covered this uh, this topic. Um, if you're watching and you want to try it out for yourself, one thing you could uh, easily experiment with is uh, there is a lab. If you go to isovalent.com slash labs, um, there is a mutual authentication lab there, which makes it super easy to uh, see how this, you know, works for yourself and see how easy it is to start from a network policy and then add just those two lines of YAML. Uh, and it's Star Wars themed in a pretty cool way, I have to say. So I seriously think you're going to really enjoy the first minute of that lab. <laughs> it's really special. Uh, there is a link to that in the uh, in the show notes as well. So uh, I think I just want to bring up this one comment, which I think echoes what we all think, that uh, that was a fantastic demo. So thank you so much, Mattia, for, for doing that. And thank you also to Thomas for bringing your knowledge and expertise to this 100th episode of Echo. Oh, we have got another question coming in. I thought we were going to wrap up, but quick one. So server-specific keys, but the authentication really happens between two Cilium agents and eBPF programs will only forward traffic once the authentication happens. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> I, I forgot to mention one thing, nothing in the pod, so even my ND4 that was completely compromised has access to the keys. So even if you completely compromised the container and couldn't access anything, even sidecar pods, there is no key material present in there. Fantastic. Uh, like Jason says, if you run that lab, do you turn the volume on, <laughs> you will be missing out if you don't have volume up. <laughs> <laughs> all right thank you everyone who's been watching thank you all for your comments and questions we do always love you know hearing from you and hearing your questions uh stacy also saying thank you for an excellent episode so with that i think we will uh no, 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 no. we need to oh. like this is your hundredth episode right like, okay <laughs> con congratulations it's been amazing and it's been a real honor to be on for the hundred because i think the first one may have been with me as well i think it was it, yeah. it was so it's been a great <laughs> honor to be on the 100th uh, as well thank you very much liz thank you for being part of it thank you to all the audience who've kept us going you know turning out these episodes we've managed to come up with something almost every week barring holidays and the occasional off-site um so uh but, and it's been a ton of fun and i have learned a whole lot doing these so far so uh if i do another i haven't done all of them i've had many co-hosts duffy cooley in particular we need to thank dan finneran who's who's watching this episode he's hosted a few nico viber and, and rafa pinson have hosted some uh jeff spalletta has uh, hosted some tracy holmes we've had a whole load of people who've who've pitched in and helped so wonderful work from all the hosts and probably some that i've forgotten so apologies for anybody i did miss out um yeah roll on the next 100 episodes thanks everyone bye thank you bye